Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I am Leo Flowers. Today's guest is Dr. Mark Golston, who is the inventor of surgical empathy, an approach that helps psychologically traumatized people heal from their inside out by causing them to feel felt and less alone in the core of their pain, feel relief, and drain the psychological pus by crying it out, which helps start a process of healing. Healing. He is the author or co-author of eight books and speaks, teaches, coaches, and mentors, leaders, and CEOs globally. Dr. Mark Golston has been described as a people hacker. Starting off as a clinical interventional psychiatrist and UCLA professor of psychiatry, he learned to hack into the minds of suicidal and potentially violent individuals to prevent acts of destruction to others or themselves. He next went on to train FBI and police hostage negotiators. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Mark Golston. Your book, Just to Listen, has resonated with so many listeners. Um, Why do you think that is? Well, it's interesting. Um, Just Listen is in 28 languages but I can't get arrested in America trying to get people to listen. So I've spoken on it in Moscow a couple of times, in Bangalore, Delhi, and Mumbai, the UK, Canada. And because I think the rest of the world currently, uh, nobody really likes to listen, but I think the rest of the world is more willing to listen than Americans. And I'm hoping to change that. Wish me well. Wish me luck because I'll need all I can get. Uh, But I think it's resonated with a lot of people because the pain of not being listened to, the pain of feeling isolated, the pain of being in an intimate relationship in that sounds and feels like an arrangement as opposed to a relationship because no relating is going on is huge. I want to share something because I know we're talking about suicide and, and I'll segue from listening to being suicidal. So uh, I, was trained as a psychiatrist and one of my focuses for 25 or more years was on suicide prevention because one of my early mentors was one of the top five pioneers in suicide prevention. If you look up the name, Dr. Ed Schneidman, he was at UCLA uh, when I was there, but uh, I was there in training. He was a mentor. And, uh, And so he referred me a lot of people who were suicidal and uh, but one of the things that I learned is that, uh, and I have a blog called "Why People Kill Themselves." It's not depression. Got four hundred thousand views in about ten days. It's still up there on Medium. And I said, "There's lots of depressed people who don't kill themselves. There's lots of people who lose a marriage or a job. They don't kill themselves. And uh, and uh, it can contribute to it. It can be the last straw." But am I working in this field for so long as a practitioner as opposed to a researcher? One of the things I talked about, uh, and this is one of the longer tangents I've taken, so thank you for giving me a long leash here, here Les, uh, Leo. But one of the things that I, my observation is that at the end, when people feel suicidal, it's because they feel despair. And if you break the word despair into des dash P-A-I-R, they feel unpaired, unpaired with the future, hopeless, unpaired with the ability to help themselves, helpless, powerless, uh, unpaired with a sense of being worth anything, worthless, uh, unpaired with anything working, it's useless, purposeless, meaningless. And sadly, when all of these things line up, pointless to go on, And what people who haven't been suicidal don't understand is that when you're feeling that kind of pain, death is compassionate to your pain. It's like the sirens calling out to the sailors saying, I'll take your pain away. And so what happens is, uh, even if you're not actively suicidal, 
you'll tuck it in your back pocket and not tell anyone and say to yourself, if worse comes to worse, I can always end the pain. And so my observation and realization is uh, they felt paired with death to take the pain away. But if you could pair with them in their feelings, and uh, I've now given a name to this process of pairing with someone in the dark night of the soul, in their hell, and we've called it surgical empathy, because you want to go in there and give them something to reach out for and let go of death as the way to end their pain. And what they'll reach out for is when they're feeling felt. So can I share an anecdote? Because you're giving me a very long leash, but hopefully I haven't you know, lost your attention. It's all about you and your information and experience. So please um, indulge us. Well, I, I hope it's been more indulging you than being self-indulgent. I always worry about that. Um, but one of the people that was referred to me, I'll call Nancy, um, was referred to me by Dr. Schneidman, and she'd made three or so suicide attempts prior to my seeing her. She'd been in the hospital multiple times per year, and way back then, you could stay in the hospital for a month, six weeks. It's not like that anymore. And I didn't think I was helping her. I mean, I was seeing her a couple times a week. She wasn't catatonic, but she rarely spoke. But I just thought, I'm not really helping her. And in those days, I used to once a month moonlight at a state psychiatric hospital. This one was in called Metropolitan State Hospital outside of Los Angeles. And sometimes I'd be up for 24 hours. And you know, when you get sleep deprived, you know, any of you listening in who have pulled an all nighter for, uh, you know, high school or college, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you know, your, your body, you, you have different sensations. So I had moonlighted uh, on one weekend and there was Nancy on a Monday and she never really made direct eye contact. And as I was seated with her, and again, I didn't think I was helping her but this was the longest she'd gone without a hospitalization or a suicide attempt. And as I was looking at her, suddenly all the color in the room turned to black and white. And I'm looking out and the room is black and white, just like a black and white photo. And I started to feel cold. And I thought, I'm having a stroke or a seizure. And so I'm a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. So I have medical training. So I did a neurologic exam on myself. I tapped on my knees. I tapped on my elbows. I looked at my fingers. Uh, it wasn't rude because she didn't make eye contact. And I thought to myself, I'm all here. You know, I'm not having a stroke or seizure. Then I had this crazy idea that I was feeling what she felt. And it was affecting the way I looked out at the world and the chills I was feeling. So I had this crazy feeling that I was in the dark night of the soul. And I leaned into it and it got worse. And because I was sleep deprived, I blurted out to her, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. But maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of the pain. And I thought to myself, because I was sleep deprived, did I just say that or did I think that? And I realized I'd said that and I thought, you just gave her a green light. You just blew it. And she looked at me. And, and she looked at me the way I'm looking at you. So I'm looking right into the camera lens. I'm not, you know, so, and I'm looking into your eyes. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm overdue. And I said, what are you thinking? And I was nervous. And she looked into my eyes and she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she smiled. And then I decided to hold, hold on to her eyes because she was holding on to my eyes. And I reached back with my eyes. And I said, I'll tell you what, 
I'm not going to give you any of the treatments that have been tried that really haven't worked unless you tell me I think I need treatment. I mean, if you tell me I think I need to be hospitalized, we'll arrange it. But I'm not going to do any of that. Would that be okay? And so here we are holding on to each other's eyes. And she was very intrigued. <laughs> she looked at me like, keep talking. And I held on to her eyes. And I'm refeeling it right now as I'm telling you. And I was right next to her in the dark night of the soul. And I said, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to find you wherever you are. And I'm going to keep you company there for as long as it takes, because you've been there all alone. And I don't want you to be there all alone. Would that be okay? And then her eyes started to water. And then the color came back, the coldness went away. So it was kind of a turning point. So what I learned is, and this is what I'm trying to teach the world, I have a personal mission in life called healing the world one conversation at a time. And I think one of the ways you do that is you, when someone is really stuck, they can't come to where you're at. They may nod and smile politely, but they just can't make it there. So you have to find a way to go there. And one of the ways to go there, and I know if you're listening in, you'll say, I can't do that. That's too scary. But one of the things Dr. Schneidman taught me, and I've expanded on it, I said, what do you do when you're with these people? He said, it's very simple. I look at them, and I don't use clinical words like, have you been depressed? How depressed are you? You know, all, all things you need to check on a list. He said, I look at them, I look in their eyes, and I'd say, where does it hurt? How much does it hurt? What about it hurts? Take me to a time when it hurts so much you didn't know how you were going to make it through it. And again, you don't just rattle these questions off, but what you're really saying to the person is, I know you're in a place that hurts so much that you can't take it anymore. Take me there. And I have a good friend who's become a good friend. Jason Reed is a serial entrepreneur. His 14-year-old son died by suicide three years ago. He and I have been doing presentations. Uh, we did a global Zoom call to an organization called YPO, Young Presidents Organization, which is all around the world. We did a live presentation to EO, which is a junior part of YPO. And if you go to uh, YouTube, Mark Goulston, and look at recent videos, you'll see the, the, the video of our live presentation to EO. It was called Own the Mental Health of Your Child. And Jason basically talks about uh, how uh, he thinks he blew it as a dad. And his son left a couple suicide notes. And one of them said, tell my story. So Jason put over $200,000 of his own money into creating a documentary called Tell My Story. And if you look up Tell My Story film, you'll find it, or ChooseLife.org. ChooseLife.org is the 501c3 that he found. And it's his story of going up and down the West Coast, talking to people who had been suicidal, parents of people who had died by suicide, treatment centers. I'm in the last 10 minutes of the documentary. And he shared a lot of insights with me. And if you're listening in, I think you'll understand that he said, you know, I basically made it impossible for my son to open up because I'm an entrepreneur. I solve problems. I give advice. And, and when someone is stuck in a place where they can't come to you, you got to go to them. He said, but I'm an entrepreneur. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I'm a black belt in karate. You know, I've, uh, I've built companies. I've failed several times. And I just bounced back. But that wasn't my son. And he shared with me this sort of haunting observation, which I think is true. He said, you know, when you ask someone you're worried about, how are you? Especially a teenager. And they say they're great. They're usually good, but when they say, I'm fine, they're not. 
And so in that presentation, in our presentations, he just relives, shares the story, starts crying because it's right there again, and it's riveting. And then he hands the mic off to me, and I say, if you're worried about someone who's suicidal, a teenager, uh, here are four prompts, because I know if you're listening in, and I apologize if this is triggering or depressing many of you, so I want to be helpful. But in that video, uh, there's four prompts that we suggest parents do with their children. And by the way, if we're talking about teenagers, don't do this with a heart-to-heart -heart talk that you initiate because that's nails on a chalkboard for a teenager. They hate these heart-to-heart -heart talks. They can't stand them. If they initiate it, I got to talk to you, mom. I got to talk to you, dad. Drop everything. But what you do is when you're having an activity, and here's the exact script. I'll give it to you. While you're doing an activity, maybe driving, uh, maybe doing something, say, you know, a lot of us parents are worried about our kids because the schools are shut down, they're opened up, you wear masks, and we're all worried. Can I run a few things by you? Hopefully your kid will say what, <laughs> if you're lucky. Say, yeah, let me just run a few things by you. And then you look at them and you say, at the worst it can feel, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life for yourself? They're going to go, what? You say, yeah, at the worst you can feel, most painful, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life for yourself? And here's a little taste of surgical empathy. Pretty awful. And you say, pretty awful or very awful? Okay, okay already, very awful. And when you're feeling that, how alone with it are you capable of feeling? All by yourself with it. Pretty alone. Pretty alone or all alone? Okay already, okay, all alone. Third prompt, take me to the last time you felt that. What? Or WTF? Yeah, so take me to the last time you felt it. What, was it 2.30 in the morning a few nights ago when we heard you walking around in your bedroom? We didn't know what that was about. Or yeah, Take me there. And here's an interesting thing that happens is when you get someone to talk about something that is so clear that you can see it with your eyes, they re-feel it. It's just the way our brains work. So if that teenager says, yeah, I was walking around, couldn't get to sleep. Yeah, we thought that. What happened next? You keep them talking. Well, you know, I tried to go to sleep and it wasn't working. And yeah, then what happened? You know, I hit the pillow. What did that do? Nothing. Then what happened? Well, you heard me walking around. I didn't know whether to kick the wall or punch the wall. Wow. What happened next? I started looking around for some of your sleeping pills, mom or dad. I couldn't find them. Then what happened? I thought I was losing my mind. And then the sun rose. I felt a little better. That's the third prompt. And you don't rush in. Oh, it's going to be okay. What you're doing is with surgical empathy, you're draining the pus of that hurt. And then the fourth thing if you're fortunate, though, you've earned the right to look at them directly and say, look at me. And they're going to say, what? I have a favor to ask you. What? The next time you feel that, or you're heading down that road, I want you to do whatever it takes to get your mom or your dad or my undivided attention because we just have too much going on in our head and there is nothing more important to us than uh, helping you feel less alone when you feel that awful. So I'm asking you to do that. So could you track with any of that, Leo? Did that make any sense? And you've been so quiet, you know, the listeners don't even know whether you just you know, took off for lunch. So I, I'm done talking. I wrote a book on listening. I need to practice it. Go ahead.
I, I, I'm just back from lunch and uh, <laughs> the, I'm just back for lunch. What did I miss, Doctor Mark? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so early on, I read somewhere that at the the core of all of us, we want to feel seen, heard, understood, and everything that you mentioned resonates with that. I example. I was at lunch with some friends and we were dining outside and uh, a person without a home approached us and there was like a little barrier between us and the, the gentleman and it's four of us sitting there dining and he stands there and starts repeating everything that we're saying. Uh, I'm like, yeah, we just got back from Hawaii. Yeah, I just got back from Hawaii. And he, he goes on like that. And we do the thing where Initially, we're ignoring him, hoping that he would leave. And finally, after about a few minutes, I turn to him and say, I see you. And he looked kind of stunned, like, what? And then I slowed it down and said, I see you. And then he looked at me and said, thank you. And then he walked away. And it was a perfect example of when we're crying out with pain and, and hurt or uh, trying to grab attention, we want to be seen, even if it's seen for something um, in the negative. Uh, negative is not the word I want to use, but uh, even if it's self-defeating behavior, we, we want to be seen, heard, and understood. So. Everything that you shared here, here, in terms of the surgical empathy, in terms of saying, you know, tell me what you were feeling, where you were feeling it, and and then also, come get me. Like, let's let's think about the future when this comes up again, because I'm not going to judge you. That's the beauty of what I loved and what you shared. Also, I'm not judging you. I'm not labeling it. I just want to sit here with you. I want to feel what you're feeling and I want to go with you. And then next time this happens, I want to let you know that I'm there for you in the future also. So yeah, definitely everything that you said resonates and connects with me on so many different levels, especially when we started off talking about despair and how it's uh, an unpairing. And I, I struggle with sugar addiction and I realized that I'm, pairing my pain with sugar. I'm pairing my discomfort. I'm pairing my boredom. And then the sugar leads to shame and guilt, which then spirals into suicidal ideations. I experienced it last night and I called a friend and we were on the phone for maybe an hour, maybe two hours or so, uh, talking our, 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 our way through it and uh and i was very grateful that she sat with me through the dark night of the soul so yes dr mark ghost and everything that you shared um resonates and i i appreciate well, it well you just shared something that was very helpful to me because i think you deconstructed it very well you said yeah what nancy felt was seen heard understood and felt and I think it's the felt that is one of the key points. One of the reasons you're addicted to sugar, and I, I'm, I'll match you sugar addiction to sugar addiction, is um, when I take a bite of one of those moon pies from Nashville that I'm addicted to, and I can't eat just one of them, um, it understands my pain. I mean, it feels it. And uh, and I got to learn some self control. But I want to share something with you. Do you have any children? I do not have children. Um, do you have someone in your life that who loves you and you love? My girlfriend Michelle, and I have three sisters. And yeah. So no here's mind. here's something that I think would work, and I'd like you to try it for your sugar addiction. Uh, reach out to either your sisters or your girlfriend and say, I'd like your help with something. What's that? I'm addicted to sugar. It's not good for me. 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, barreling towards diabetes. So I'm a real setup for it. Uh, and I'd like your help, but you can say uh, respectfully, no, you don't have to, I'm asking, you can say no. Uh, what is something that you need to do that is good for you that you don't want to do? Say that to your girlfriend, or your sisters, and you pick something that is good for you, you know it, but you're just not doing it. And they pick something. And you say, I'll make a deal with you. And we are addicts. So we have to check in with each other one day at a time, you know, one sugary bite at a time. But I can tell you that if I can picture you who I love doing something that you don't want to do that's good for you, if I can picture you're doing that, I might be able to resist the impulse. And I want to be able to see it vividly and viscerally. So it has to be really something I can picture. I mean, if it's, well, I need more self-discipline, tell me what you mean by self-discipline. But if you're listening in, or you, Leo, I, I think, uh, and I should do this with my wife and children. I'd say, I need your help because I don't exercise. I don't eat as well as I could. Maybe I'll do that. You know, we're all, uh, we're all having some challenges. Uh, COVID has entered our family and we're trying to stay safe from it. Um, but if I could picture my children and my wife doing something that's really good for them, but they don't want to do, I think picturing them, I can't make promises uh, and maybe I can just be a, uh, a, I'm not a drinker, but maybe I could be a moderate moon pie eater. I could, maybe I could stop at one <laughs> or stop at none. But if I, even now, as I'm talking to you, just picturing them doing whatever that is that they don't want to do, but that's good for them. I, I think it would give me some strength. What do you think of that idea? I love that idea. And the reason I love that is when we talk about suicidal suicidality, the research has shown that when we read about people who end their lives, it increases the potential of people then wanting to end their life. However, when we read about people who um, are bring themselves to the brink, but then find the strength or hope to pull themselves back, then that reduces suicidal ideation, right? So when you're talking about imagining someone doing something that they, that would be good for them, but they don't want to do that, we, that instills in us, I would imagine that feeling of I'm not alone in this struggle, which goes back to sitting with somebody in the dark night of their soul is, oh, that means that person understands what I'm feeling. So to me, that's, that's what I'm, I'm experiencing right now is when I think about somebody else doing something that they don't want to do, but is good for them, I go, okay, they know exactly how I feel. They're doing it. So then that means that I can do it and I'm not alone in doing this. So it's, that's a very powerful share. I really appreciate that. Well, uh, it, you just triggered something else. So you're teaching me a lot. I hope I, I hope you're getting the better end of this than I am. Uh, um, I hadn't thought about it. So you just said that. Not only would it help you feel less alone, but a lot of times as we drill down, a number of people who say, maybe I don't deserve to be happy. You know, I can be pretty self-absorbed. I can be self-involved. Uh, and even though the world thinks I'm this, you know, really terrific person, when I drill down into my the shadow of my personality, I can be pretty self-absorbed. But the fact that you're not, not only not alone, but that person can come back and say to you, I want to thank you for that bargain we came because you helped me to overcome something that I've never been able to overcome. And so 
I think that can increase your sense of self-worth as opposed to worthless and self-absorbed. And it's interesting because I work with organizations and corporations, and, and one of the things that we've developed, which changes a culture of a company like magic, is, is to get people anonymously to share what their greatest struggles are, personally or professionally, it's all anonymous. And then what happens is we arrange for them to, ha to have formed support and accountability groups, and they meet on Zoom every week. So if one of the self-defeating behaviors is they procrastinate, there's a group, you know, we're all going to commit to each other, that we're not going to procrastinate, and we'll each select something that we've been procrastinating on. Uh, or if this is the group that just doesn't learn from its mistakes, well, we're all going to commit that in the next week when we make a mistake, instead of getting all defensive and upset, you know, we, you know, we're going to take a deep breath, own it, and learn from it. And it's changing cultures in a huge way, because if you think about this, a lot of times when you try to change the culture of an organization, it always feels insincere. Yeah, they're throwing, they're throwing something nice at us because they want better performance, but they don't really care about us. But when you arrange these accountability and support groups, think of what it's going to do for appreciation, gratitude, and loyalty when some of your people say, hey, you remember that little exercise that we did when uh, Dr. Goulston came in and started it going? Uh, because of that, I've overcome something that I've never overcome my entire life. So can you see the power of what we're talking about? Absolutely. It's interesting you say that, and I resonate with the power of it because there are days where I recognize I'm going to struggle with sugar or the task that I want to get done. And I will do an accountability post on Facebook. I'll post, I'll say, this is an accountability post. Here are the three things that I'm vowing to get done today. And then I'll post those. And then that, and then I'll post when I'm done. And just knowing that other people have read it, seen it, and are expecting the results that empowers me or emboldens me or encourages me to move forward with the task. And I, I guess it's another part of, once again, not feeling alone in the struggle. You know, I played t a lot of team sports, Dr. Goldston, and um, there was nothing better than winning and celebrating with the team. And there was also nothing more painful than losing and being with the team. But there was something nurturing about losing with others versus if you lost by yourself. I couldn't imagine being a tennis player. Yeah, I'll share something with you. I did a, uh, uh, I did a program with a company called, I can say the company, the, name, the company is called Inc. Global. And Inc. Global publishes, they used to publish 80% of the in-flight magazines, United, American, but nobody's going to touch a magazine now because they're dirty with COVID. So, uh, and they survive by selling advertising. So they've switched over to digital. So when you go on a plane, you see the screens. They also own 80% of the airport monitors that you see in the public area, and they've uh, they've started their own studio because CNN, uh, I guess I can just say that CNN basically said, uh, we don't want to be on uh, in the red states. We don't want CNN on your monitors in the airport because the red states don't particularly like CNN. And so he, uh, so there's about 150 people in the company and they're going into COVID and they're in, uh, all around the world. And I coached the, the uh, joint CEO, a fellow from Great Britain named Simon Leslie. And he trusts me. He said, well, see if you can help my people. And this gets back to what you said about losing. And, uh, and I'm the opposite of being a rah-rah, let's pump ourselves up. Because when I've seen people who come into a company and say, let's get pumped up, let's not let this give up, to, give into this, 
they can often pump people up. But as soon as the pump leaves, people deflate. They go home, they go back to their thing, and they deflate. So I did the opposite. So I want you to picture this. This is, this is a good story, I think. So there's about over 100 people on a Zoom screen. And you know, you know, I can see them. And I said, I'd like you to imagine the worst moment you've had in the last week. And they look at me like deers in the headlights. They go, what? I said, yeah. Imagine the worst moment you had in the last week and raise your hand when you're there. So they pause, and then one by one, they're raising their hands. And I said, I'm going to give you a bunch of words. And in the chat area, write the word that connects with that bad moment. And there's something in a neuropsychology that when you can add the accurate word to what you're feeling, it lessens agitation. And, and so, again, I look at the chat area. They're looking at me like I'm a little bit crazy. And then they start, and here are the words, anxious, angry, afraid, overwhelmed, numb, alone, ashamed, uh, uh, depressed, a bunch of words. And then one by one, people with their names start entering the words in the chat area. You know, John, angry. Mary, overwhelmed. And you and imagine this, here's the Zoom call, you look in the chat area, and suddenly it starts to flood with people just with their name and the emotional words. And you look at the screen and people are crying because they're feeling relief because they don't feel alone. And then after we did the exercise, I said, how many of you felt better with that? 70%. How many of you felt worse? zero. How many of you felt no change? 30%. I said, how many of you feel that you're, you're in the presence of a group of very special people? 100%. I said, you know, you're no different than you were an hour ago. What happened is you shared a special moment where you weren't alone. Uh, and you're with really strong, courageous, people battling through these times, and you feel it's an honor to be part of this group. Isn't that true? And they all agree with it. And then after the exercise, uh, someone comes up to Simon and says, that was the best exercise I've ever done <laughs> anywhere. And so if you go to my website, markgoulston.com, and you click on testimonials, Simon, the CEO, afterwards gives me a video testimonial. He, he, he sounds drunk. He says, I don't know what to say to you. I don't know what you just did. And he just went, I mean, he just starts blubbering. And I said, and it so touched me. And Simon and I, we have a good relationship. I said, you mind if I put that up on my website? I mean. He said, well, you know, I looked a little bit drunk. Were you? No, no, you just, you're just overwhelmed. So now when I'm feeling a little down, uh, you go to my testimonial page, just tw about 25 videos of people sharing on video and their selfies, how I help them. That's overwhelming. I can hardly look at it because it's like, wow, wow. If you ever thought you had the imposter syndrome, looks like you're fooling a bunch of people. <laughs> You're so accurate in terms of when we're able to accurately label our emotions, the agitation dissipates. I remember being in an airport feeling flooded and I could not determine what the feeling was, what the emotion was. And because I grew up in a household where there weren't any emotions, you're either pissed or cool. That was it. And now I'm learning the nuances of emotions and feelings. And I realized I was feeling powerless. And as soon as I was able to accurately label the feeling of powerlessness, there was such a levity, such a buoyancy, such a relief. I felt like I, I taken the first breath I had taken that entire day. And there's so much power 
and being able to name it, claim it, and then dump it. As soon as I recognized, as soon as I was able to name how I felt and, and claim it and own it and be like, okay, that's what powerlessness feels like. Then I shared it with, with other people on, on social media because I think that's, because I, I, not I think, but from my experiences, I've never heard someone admit publicly to feeling powerless uh, unless it's in a, in a book or, you know, maybe a talk show. But in real life, that's not a word that comes up often. So, um, yeah, that and, and so and to your point, Dr. Goldston, I keep an emotional wheel with me at all times. It's on my um, my as a screensaver. And I also like there's a few pages with different emotions so that I can. The other day I had an emotion that I never labeled before, but I, I and never recognized. But something somebody said something. And I was like, wow, I feel nauseated. I felt nauseated by that emotion. And it's so much fun. At first, I was like, I'm not this whole emotional thing, whatever. But then it becomes fun searching for and figuring out and exploring the different emotions and realizing how layered uh, how we feel uh, can be. So, yes, thank you for sharing that. Well, you know, there's a whole uh, neuro psychology to it. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that when we're stressed, it's uh, our cortisol spikes. A lot of people know that. And yes, it helps to meditate. Yes, it helps to do yoga. But um, what a lot of people don't know is that what counteracts high cortisol, which gets us agitated, is high oxytocin, which is the hormone of bonding. It's the hormone of feeling felt, not just feeling understood, but feeling felt. It's what enables uh, young mothers to tolerate an infant who won't sleep through the night, an infant who won't feed. They have so much oxytocin on board that the bonding is so powerful, it probably protects them from really getting, they get frustrated, they get tired, but they don't get angry at the infant because of the oxytocin. What happened in that room of Inc. Global is we flooded them with oxytocin. I'll share something else because maybe someone will contact me. Um, two years ago, I was on a panel at Hollywood High School, or maybe three years ago, it was before COVID. And it was a panel on stress. So these were high school students meeting after school in the cafeteria. And there was a panel. And whenever I'm on a panel, I say, let me go last. Let me be the cleanup hitter because I never know what I'm going to talk about, but I'll try and tie everything together. I just seem to have a little bit of that ability. And the other three people were wonderful. There were two life coaches and a therapist, and they talked about stress and anxiety. But I could see that, you know, after about 40 minutes, that the students were getting a little bit edgy. And I could tell that I was in trouble because they were about to wheel in the pizza. And I was about to say, forget it all. Let's just go eat. <laughs> and so I knew I was in trouble competing against pizza. No way. But I did with them what I did with the Inc. Global thing. So imagine this. We're in the cafeteria. There's about 30, 30 to 40 high school students. And I said, I'm going to try something. I tried it on another, uh, you know, with this company. And I said, I'd like you to think of the, the, the worst time you've had in the last week. And just raise your hand when you can think of it. They did that. They raised their hands. And they're looking at me like, again, just like the Inc. Global people, this guy's crazy. And I said, here are the, a bunch of words. And I want you, we're going to go one by one. You're going to pick the word that matches how you felt at that worst time. So you're not going to go into an explanation. You're just going to pick the word, the feeling word. And one by one, uh, you know, I started with the row, first row and the uh, person the furthest on my left and they started angry, alone, ashamed, overwhelmed. And uh, afterwards, I said, how did that feel? They said, that felt great. I said, really? Those are such downer words. Well, why do you feel great? They said, I didn't feel so alone. I, I felt great. Well, did you judge anyone? No, not at all. And then I said to them, 
how many of you feel that you're in a group of very special people? They said, oh, yeah. I said, well, what it was is you shared a special moment. And I said, what I'd like you to do is hear those words. You have a friend who's in difficulties. Say this crazy psychiatrist came into the school and you ask your friend, you know, when you're feeling at your worst, which of these feelings do you feel? And then get them to talk and, and, and keep talking, you know, help them get it off their chest. And I said, here's your challenge as a teenager. You run on four emotions, and those emotions are excitement, boredom, fear, and anger. Excitement, boredom, fear, and anger. And you just felt something different. And you felt better. That's your lesson. So you take this out and practice it with other people. And what was interesting is after we did this, one of the teachers or one of the people who was organizing this came up to me and said, I was behind all the students when you were doing this. So they were facing you. And when, and when each of them, it was their turn, they tensed up because they were on the spot. But when they used the word angry, alone, they said, they suddenly relaxed as soon as they said the word and they were like dominoes. They, as soon as they said the word, they leaned towards you in the panel because they leaned into the oxytocin. They leaned into the feeling felt. I, I've heard you mention earlier that someone felt frustrated, but not angry. How are you distinguishing those two emotions? Well, here's, a, here's another tip. So I gave you the four prompts. So here's a tip if you're dealing in a, a relationship. You can use this with your girlfriend or your sisters. Uh, and it's called the FUD crud. Why is it called that? Because you'll remember FUD crud. Uh, and what it stands for is if you have someone in your life and they're venting or they're sullen, instead of getting agitated or uh, upset with them, let them say whatever they say, pause, don't get defensive. And here's the FUD part of the FUD crud. You say, you sound as if you're frustrated and I think you're holding back. They're going to go, what? Yeah, you sound frustrated and I think you're holding back because I think you're also, here's the FUD, I think you're also upset and disappointed. So fill me in what you're frustrated about and upset and disappointed and maybe we can fix this. Now you do it in that order because everyone will talk about being frustrated. But if you say you sound upset, you run the risk of their say, I'm not upset. When you say to someone, you sound angry, they feel like you're shaming them. So you got to give them something that opens the door. And, and then when they say whatever they're frustrated about, here's more surgical empathy. If they use words like always, never, awful, terrible, let them say whatever they're saying. Here's the surgical empathy. Say more about the awful thing. Even if it's about you. Oh, you're awful and you do. And so you want to pull it all out of them. That's the surgical empathy. And then after you do that for a while and you feel like they've gotten that frustration out, what you say to them, and this is very important, you could say, if I was you, I'd be upset too. So you want to normalize it because that's the potentially shaming word. If you say, well, you sound upset, you run the risk of their saying, well, I'm not upset. But if you say, if I was you, I'd feel upset too. What are you upset about? You do the same thing. They say something that has some emotion on it. You let them finish and you say, say more about I'm terrible. Or I, or, I always do this. Oh, you're right, I do. Oh. And then you do that for a while and then you say, and if I was you, I'd be disappointed, disappointed in me, disappointed here that we're here again, disappointed. I don't know what, but can you tell me what you might be disappointed about? And if you do this in your patient and you watch them, they are going to calm down. And if you love the person because they've been open with you and you're not on the defensive, you're actually in charge of this very intimate conversation. After they share that with you, it's a little bit like the four prompts we talked about early. 
after they share what they're frustrated, upset, and disappointed about, you say, look at me. And by this time, they're going to be crying because they feel relieved. And you say, look at me. And they're going to be a little shy because this is a little bit more intimate than people have ever experienced in their life. And they look at you and you say, uh, everything you said, I've done. I've been wrong. You deserve better. I'm going to fix this. And I'm sorry. You say that it can totally change a relationship. The whole frustration, upset, disappointed, those are all feelings that I'm starting to explore more and become aware of. And I had no idea that that's more of what I was feeling, the frustration more than anger. I, I, I feel like I, I, I go, I skip over anger and it's straight rage. It's either rage or frustration. I don't experience anger too often, but definitely the disappointment. So, here, so, so here's the growth thing for you. And, and a good place to do this is with your sisters, with your girlfriend. One of the things that most people, especially men, try to avoid, and this is why when my, that's why it was so powerful when my mentor, Dr. Steinman, told me, is they avoid sharing how hurt and afraid they are. Hurt because they just feel this wound that's ripping them apart. Afraid because they're afraid. I don't think it's ever going to get better, and I'm never really going to have a happy life, and it's just a matter of time before I screw it up again. And so people run away from that. But if you can start, you can share with your sisters or your girlfriend, say, uh, do you know what it's like to feel a lot of hurt and be afraid and be afraid to open up? And one of the reasons you don't open up about it, Leo, like all of us, is at the core of you, you don't have basic trust because of how you grew up. Eric Erickson talked about psychosocial development. And at the bottom of our personalities is we either have basic trust or basic mistrust. And if you have basic trust, you go into the world as an adventure. If you have basic mistrust, you go into the world with fear. And it's interesting. Uh, I'm blessed. I have three young grandchildren, three and under, and I see them every day. And I'm bathing them with basic trust. My daughters will say, you're going to do the googly eye thing with my kid today? Because I just look into their eyes, and they're not speaking, but I look into their eyes, and they're just looking at me, and I can hold on to their eyes just like I'm holding on to you right now. I'm looking around the camera, and I'm looking right into your eyes. And I almost hypnotize them by just doing that. And I'm basically communicating, you have no idea how glad I am that you were born. You're going to have a good life. There's going to be bumps. But as long as I'm around, you're going to get through them. So that's what I'm feeling as I'm looking into their eyes. And they're just holding on to me. I mean, you know, they're one and a half. They're probably thinking, just change my freaking diaper. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but do you follow what I'm saying is I want to bathe them. And I didn't do that with my kids because I was so busy earning a living. You know, I check a box. Are they fed? You know, are they changed? Are they ready for school? Uh, my kid's nickname for me, which we laugh at, but I'm ashamed of, is their nickname for me was uh, uh, Hi Kids, Bye Kids, Love You Kids. Mm. That was their nickname for me. Hi Kids, Bye Kids, Love You Kids. But it just meant that I was trying to be a responsible dad. Wow. How are we doing on time? Because I, I, I think we're running into you know my, my next. Uh, we're doing great. I, I want to circle to the one last thing. Back in terms of, you shared earlier that I'm asking, um, uh, in terms of ask someone who has struggled with something that uh, would be good for them, but it's hard for them to do, but they do it anyway. And I realize 
it's the reason why I love to read biographies because in bios, I can read about people who definitely are doing things that they don't want to do, but they do it anyway for the, the bigger purpose. George Washington didn't want to be uh, president a second term. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell didn't want to promote his telephone. So uh, for the listeners out there, uh, there, that's the power of reading fiction in books and that you can find those people if you don't feel like you have them in your life physically. You can find them in, in books and other forms of media, but you know, obviously choose wisely. Uh, Dr. Mark Golston, I know you have a birthday coming up February. Uh, you'll be 70, what, 74? I'm half past dead here. Yeah, I'll be 74. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there anything that you do on your birthday to commemorate it, celebrate it, or is there anything you've done in the past that you were like, oh, I'd like to spend more of my birthdays like that? Um, here's something that only an older person can appreciate. Uh, when you get to be my age, what I encourage people is, is I look back at my present from the eyes of my future, and I'm appreciative of what I still have instead of what I know I'm going to lose. So when we had Christmas dinner, uh, the family, I didn't want to share this with them because it's kind of morbid. I was looking at them and saying, wow, we're all here together. You're connecting with each other. Uh, Alzheimer's runs in my family. And I was thinking, I, I hope it's not true, but there's a possibility in 10 years, I won't even know any of you. And I was just looking at them with this incredible appreciation, like, wow. Now that's a, that's an old person talking. Whereas you know a lot of people when they're pushing sixty, they oh I got pains, I've lost such and such, and I'm angry. So, but at my age, uh, instead of focusing on what I've lost, I focus on what I still have. So for my birthday, uh, I hope my family will be around me, and uh, uh, and we got a little COVID going through the family, so I, I really mean that. Uh, it hasn't hit me yet, but it could. Um, and I'm just going to look at them the way I look at my grandchildren. And I'm not going to say I'm looking at you through the eyes of me being 85 and not knowing who any of you are. That's a little bit depressing. But I'll look at them, and they're going to see the love in my eyes. And I'm going to say, well, they'll say, what's going on? And I'll say, uh, I'll start crying now. I'll say, uh, you just don't know how lucky I feel. And it's because of all of you. Thank you for sharing that. And last question I ask of all my guests, because I imagine there's someone listening in who may be on the precipice of wanting to end their life. Before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Dr. Mark Goldston? Uh, Reach out to, and you'll list this because I haven't memorized it, but there's a National Suicide Lifeline. Um, and these people are highly trained. They've usually been touched by suicide in their family. And just start speaking with them. And you might think, what will speaking do? You know, how is it going to help me? Uh, Something that I've shared is that uh, uh, a lot of people get suicidal when they feel the next step is they're going to lose their mind and it's not going to come back. A lot of veterans feel this way. But if you ask the veterans who were suicidal and then didn't, what, what helped? A number of them will say, I found God. And really what it was is they were holding a gun and they surrendered control and they said god i don't want to die but i can't take it anymore and what happened is something inside them felt the presence of god or they felt the presence of their children or the people whatever who love them and they surrendered to it and they started crying and what happened is instead of falling apart as they started to cry they started to feel relief and they felt this is weird. I'm crying and I'm feeling better. 
this is crazy. And that's why a lot of them will say, uh, you know, I found I surrendered. And really what it was is they let go of control. And instead of worrying that they would fall apart, they started to cry, felt better, and then began the road of coming back together again. So reach out, please. Thank you so much. Crying is the antidote to crazy. Right, that, that's me. That's not a Dr. Mark Ghost. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, listeners, for tuning in. Remember, this podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help. For you calling the 1-800-SUICIDE or 1-800-273-TALKS. You can always go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark Goldstein. Thank you for having me on, Leo.